I think I say every week that we've got great questions. So many great questions for the mailbag. This is the best week yet for questions. But I got to say, a couple of the questions you guys came up with this week, they're as good as any we've had. I'm really looking forward to talking about this. I'm not even going to waste time on the preamble. I'll waste time on plugging the website and the YouTube channel and all of that. But the little, the little uh, uh, cold open that we do before the intro song, I'm not going to waste time here because I just want to jump into it. It's the Morning Pit Mailbag. It's a Friday. It's YouTube.com slash Panther.com. Like I said, it's Friday. It's the morning pit. It's youtube.com slash pantalaircom. I'm Chris Peak from pantalair.com. Glad to be with you here on a Friday. Glad to make it to the end of the week with you. Just one day away from pit basketball getting back on the court. Panthers will be at Miami tomorrow. Looking forward to that. It's been an interesting week, an eventful week with, you know, a couple of road basketball wins since last Saturday. Uh, schedule release for football. Got to finally talk to some of the new transfers. I mean, like, there's been interesting stuff going on. A ton of recruiting activity. Hopefully, you've been keeping up on the message boards at pantalair.com so you don't miss anything. And you know the website for your most comprehensive pit sports coverage on the internet, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. Now, if you go to that website, you can keep up on all of the pit sports news. Football, basketball, or recruiting, it's all right there. And, of course, message boards to interact with other Pit fans all day, every day. Pit fans are hanging out on the message boards at pantherlair.com, talking about everything going on in the world of pit sports. Panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. And our YouTube channel right here, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. That's where we put all our video content. We have these daily morning pit videos where it always culminates at the end of the week with the mailbag like we're doing here on a Friday. We got our weekly live show that we do every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Always look forward to that, and hopefully you get a chance to check those out. Those are always fun. Uh, me and Jim Hammett get together for a little bit of pit sports talk, and uh, we take your comments and questions, and it's just a good back and forth. And then we do that same sort of thing on the post-game show. For every pit road basketball game, we go live after the game right here at youtube.com slash pantalaircom to talk about the game and what we saw and what we thought. It's a lot of fun. We have a back and forth. Sometimes we do shots, whatever the day, whatever the occasion calls for. We didn't do any shots on Tuesday night because it was a school night, but after the Duke game last Saturday, yeah, we had a shot. It's a Pennsylvania bourbon. It's always fun to bring out the Pennsylvania bourbon after a game against Louisville, you know? Um, or Duke, as the case may be. Uh, but it's a lot of fun, and hopefully, you you know, if you're, you you watch the game and you want to get ready into a conversation about it, flip right over here to youtube.com slash pantalaircom. We usually start just a couple minutes after the game ends, and we talk for like 45 minutes or an hour about the game, and you can be part of the conversation with the chat screen. You post in the chat screen, you post your comment or your question, and we'll interact and, and converse about it. It's a lot of good times. Uh, we have a lot of fun. Uh, on the Panther Lair uh, post-game show. So like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash pantherlaircom, and that way you won't miss any of our pit video content. All right, let's jump into the questions. We do this every week. We do the mailbag on Friday. We take questions on the message board at pantherlair.com. It's the Between Fifth and Forbes message board, uh, our premium football message board, but we take questions about football, basketball, recruiting, whatever else is on your mind. And Smenges gets us started off with a question. I mean, he's one of our reliables. Smenges is always coming through with questions for the mailbag, and we appreciate you, sir. There's a few of you guys that always come up with questions, and I can't thank you enough. Smenges has a great question here. Now that Jalen Lowe is healthy, is this looking like the best pair of freshman guards in pit history? And I'll admit, when I first read this question, I was like, Let's chill with the hyperbole, Smenges. Let's let's relax a little bit. The best pair in pit history. I mean, come on now. Like, they're good, but we we always fall into this trap of overhyping or overestimating or or o not even overestimating. Um, overhyping or just making too much out of what we're experiencing. That was the greatest game ever. That was the greatest play ever. That was the greatest Super Bowl. This is the greatest this or that's the greatest that. Let's just relax. We're in the moment. It's exciting. They've won two in a row. I know we're all pumped up about it. That was my initial reaction. Then I started, then I was, but I was like, well, let's hold on. Let's, let's look. You know what I mean? Maybe there's something I'm not thinking of. Maybe I'm getting too caught up in the moment and just assuming that it's not low in Carrington. Let's look back and find out, you know, you know, if it's obviously not these guys, who is it? And what I found is there's not a lot to choose from. Yeah, you know, The Rivals database goes back to 2002. So you're looking over the last 20 some years, 20 plus years. There's really not that many. One, two, three, four times 
prior to this, you know, prior to 2023, when Pitt even signed multiple guards in the same recruiting class, when Pitt even had multiple scholarship freshman guards on the roster at the same time. Like the last time it happened prior to this year was 2018 with Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's. So right there is kind of a good example that 2018-19 season, that's how long it's been since, you know, Pitt signed two freshman guards in the same class. So you're already looking at like a five-year window just to get to that. Now, the year before that, yeah, Kevin Stalling signed Marcus Carr and Parker Stewart and Cameron Davis. So you get back-to-back there with multiple freshman guards in the same class. And I'm not including JUCOs, I'm not including transfers or anything like that. I'm just talking about true freshman guards coming out of high school or prep school or whatever the case may be. And so even if you just compare it to the last two times it happened and you think about how they were as freshmen, I mean, we could look up the stats on Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's and and there was a lot of excitement about Xavier Johnson and and Trey McGowan's as freshmen. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, Xavier Johnson as a freshman at Pitt averaged 15.5 points per game, 3.9 rebounds and 4.5 assists, which are, I mean, numbers that are, comparable if not better than what bub carrington's doing right now xavier johnson 15 and a half points per game bub carrington 13.5 you know uh xavier johnson 3.9 rebounds per game bub carrington 5.2 and then assists they're almost dead even bub is 4.4 and xavier was 4.5 so you have a pretty good comparison there between carrington and johnson and if you bring up trey mcgowan's stats so i mean right now jalen lowe is averaging 7, 2, and 2.6. So let's just call it that. Trey McGowan's as a freshman averaged 11.6 points per game. So that's, you know, four and a half more than Jalen Lowe is averaging right now. He averaged 3.2 rebounds, which is 1.3 more than Jalen Lowe is averaging, and 1.7 assists. So he's he's uh, almost an assist per game less than what Jalen Lowe is averaging. And so it's interesting because I, I think if you're, you know, my first blush reaction was like, you know, after I got over the, the, no, of course it's not them. You know, when I glanced at the names, Johnson and McGowan's, I was like, well, not those guys, Carrington and lower, definitely better by the numbers. They're not by the numbers. And, and I'm talking just about statistics and production. I'm not even getting into team wins or, or sort of the eyeball test, but by the numbers, McGowan's and Johnson outperformed Carrington and Lowe. So maybe we don't have to go that far to find another pair that's that's better than than these two. But of course, it's not just about the numbers. I mean, I think when you look at the way these two guys are playing, they're they're very exciting to watch. But you know, the reality is, we were all pretty excited about Xavier Johnson and, and Trey McGowan's in 2018 and 2019, right? Their freshman year. I mean, they led Pitt to it. It looked like oh, you know, Pitt's going to be something. Now they had a really rough year. Um, we'll see where this current season ends up. But it's interesting that, I mean. Maybe everything that has happened since that season, so in the last five years, has kind of clouded our impression of Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's. But by the numbers, they outperform what Carrington and Lowe are doing. Now, right now, you know Lowe is in the midst of a seven-game stretch where he's averaging 12 points per game, which evens it up a little bit more. I think that actually, what did I say McGowan's averaged? McGowan's averaged 11.6, so... Jalen Lowe over the last seven games is better than Trey McGowan's was or is, is performing at a higher level and producing at a higher level than Trey McGowan's did in in his freshman season. So, okay, yeah, right now, maybe like like literally right now, at this moment, whenever you're watching this on January 26th, yes, Carrington and Lowe are a better freshman duo. But over the course of the whole season, it's not quite there, at least in terms of production. And we'll see where they're at by the end. If if McGow or if, if Lowe keeps playing the way he's playing right now, then they might have a chance. You know, what I mean, to to surpass. But then you you work backward from there, and I mean, I'm not just going to stop the conversation at, at Trey Trey McGowan's and Xavier Johnson. I'm going to keep looking back. Like I say, the year before that, Kevin Stallings signed Marcus Carr, Parker Stewart, and Cameron Davis. Those are good players, and, and I think those you know Stewart and Carr had a good freshman season for Pitt. Before that, the last time they signed two freshman guards in the same class you go back to 2008 i'm skipping over 2012 when they signed josh newerkirk and jamel artis because even though artis would ultimately remember the jamel artis is the point guard that wasn't until like his third or fourth year so we're not going to go uh you know 
we're not going to count him as signing as a freshman guard. So we have to skip back to 2008 when it was Ashton Gibbs and Trey Woodall. Those are very good players. I don't know that they necessarily produced or were relied on as freshmen the way Lowe and Carrington are being relied on. And to some extent, you know, and you go back to 2004 with Ronald Ramon and Keith Benjamin coming in the same class, it's sort of the same thing. I mean, in 2004, 2008, they didn't have to rely on those guys. 2017, yeah, Kevin Stallings had to rely on Marcus Carr and Parker Stewart. 2018, Jeff Capel had to rely on Xavier Johnson and Trey McGowan's. 2004, 2008, Jamie Dixon didn't need to rely on, on Gibbs and Woodall or Ramon and Benjamin to be starters and lead contributors because those teams were established and they had linkage and carry over from year to year. But they're still good players. Um, they just weren't needed quite as much. So the rivals database only goes back to 2002, right? And so I was, I was, you know, I was like, well, what am I gonna, you know, uh, do I just cut it off there and say, okay, yeah, Lowe and Carrington are no worse than the second best freshman duo of guards in the last 22 years or whatever it's been. But I consulted with our good friend Sam Shulo, one of the the preeminent pit historians that you're gonna find, and I asked him. And the first thing he came up with was 1995, the 95-96 season. That year, Vontigo Cummings and Kelly Taylor were freshmen. Cummings averaged 6.4 points per game, 3.4 rebounds, and 2.9 assists. Uh, Taylor averaged 9-3. and three. Um, Those guys, I think, would become very good players, and they were pretty good as freshmen, uh, not quite producing on the level of Carrington and Lowe. And then the other, I mean, this is actually the first one that came to mind for Sam, and this is a great one, 1987, Sean Miller and Jason Matthews. Now, in terms of, like, full career and pro, I mean, you're not going to do much better than Miller and Matthews. I mean, that's a high, high bar for Carrington and Lowe to reach. And I'm not saying it's out of reach for them, um, but it seems unlikely, it seems unlikely anybody's going to reach that bar of coming in as a pair of true freshmen to pit in the same class as a freshman Miller averaged nine, three and or nine, two and almost six assists per game. That's probably the most impressive stat. He was 9.3 points and 1.9 rebounds per game, but he averaged 5.8 assists per game as a true freshman, which, you know, I thought it was impressive when Bub Carrington was averaging 4.4 assists per game. Sean Miller averaged 5.8. And then Matthews, Jason Matthews averaged eight points per game, uh, one and a half rebounds and 1.6 assists per game. So there's some competition, but not much, uh, simply because there haven't been that many years when they've had two true freshman guards on the team right now. Like, so right now in the context of the last seven games, yeah, Carrington and Lowe are probably the high watermark. Uh, but Johnson and McGowan's were really good as freshmen. And they were the reason that a lot of people were excited for the direction of pit basketball. And we, like I say, we all know what direction it ultimately went in, and it, and I, I think our views are sort of corrupted by that, understandably so. But if you're just talking about freshman year, um, the bar is set pretty high for you know by Johnson and McGowan's. I think Carrington and Lowe can get there. I think they just keep getting better, but the bar is set pretty high. So that's a great question. I mean, look at this. We're way into this video and just talking about – freshman guards in pit history that that's a good conversation uh i hope we carry it over to the message boards and have some interaction there about it uh next question kielbasier dennis again one of the great message board uh usernames kielbasier dennis says uh when is the Cade bell interview and this is i mean like this just gets asked every day i know he's, do, he's doing it sarcastically but it just gets asked every day look bell's on the road recruiting the time to do it would have been you know probably the week after christmas but he was still trying to get moved into Pittsburgh, and then after that, he was back on the road recruiting. And when he's on the road, rec road recruiting, he's not going to come home from recruiting to uh, talk to the media. So my guess is once there's a dead period in another week or two, a recruiting dead period where the coaches can't be on the road, we'll get a chance to talk to the new assistants. Certainly, Cade Bell, hopefully, will be one of them. Um, Let's see. Infomaniac asks, lots of talk about Charlie Partridge from the incoming guys. His reputation is very strong. What is the most likely scenario to replace him someday? Is Pitt grooming a defensive line replacement coach on the staff that is currently absor absorbing as much as they can from Charlie? Or will Pitt just take their chances via a future hire off of another staff? I think he's got an assistant, like a GA or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure if that's somebody necessarily being groomed to take over that position, but Look, ultimately, I mean, you'll have good coaches on your staff, and ultimately those guys will leave for one reason or another. I think, obviously, Pitt would like to keep Charlie Partridge as long as they can. 
we'll see how long that is. I, you know, I, is there like a concrete plan in place for replacing him? I, I, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, Pat Narduzzi hasn't told me if there is, uh, but it's, you know, coaches come and go. I, I think if there's a head coach who's got something very strong and firmly, firmly established, then you want to have some sort of succession plan in place uh, for assistant coaches. Probably not, not quite as much. Austin 26 says, given their current record, what does the pit basketball team have to do in the balance of the season for most to consider the season a success? I, I mean, the, the surest way to get this season considered a success, kind of the lowest bar to clear um, that would also guarantee people would look at the season as a success is getting back to the NCAA tournament. And I, and I say that's the lowest bar to clear because I, I think, you know, you could get an, oh, well, if they, if they win the ACC, if they win the ACC, that'll be a success. Or if they win the ACC tournament, that'll be a success. Or you know, obviously they make the final fours. I mean, like there's all those things. But at a minimum, it's making the NCAA tournament. Now that's, that's the lowest bar to clear out of those potential goals, but it is by no means a low bar to clear. As I sit here at 12 and seven, and three and five in the ACC with 12 more games to play in the regular season, they've made, they've created a very difficult task for themselves. You know, those two losses at Syracuse are, they sting because there's a big difference in being 12 and seven and three and five and being 14 and five and five and three. That's a world of difference. You are much closer to crossing that 20 win plateau, which may or may not guarantee you anything vis a vis the, uh, you know, postseason opportunities uh but you are much closer to crossing that 20 win plateau and pushing into 21 22 23 where you get yourself closer and closer to uh postseason eligibility that you know that stings those those losses hurt the missouri loss hurts you you couldn't afford to drop those games um and they did it and and they had you know and, and that's to say nothing of the opportunity they they had against north carolina where they really could have put north carolina down early in the game and they were unable to do so and carolina couldn't make a shot Pitt was never able to pull away and so it was a missed opportunity there uh but to guarantee it it's being you know viewed as a success you got to make the ncaa tournament jay lazinger asked do you think eight and four the rest of the way gets Pitt into the tourney I mean, I, I think if you go eight and four the rest of the way, obviously some of it will depend on who those eight are. But kind of regardless of who you beat, if you go eight and four the rest of the way, I mean, I you got to win at least two in the ACC tournament, if not three. I think to really lock yourself in. I mean, I think, I forget how that math would work out, but I mean, making the, the semifinals of the ACC tournament, you know, that, that would probably give you a pretty good shot. Um, but it's tough. You know, there, it always used to be that 20 win barrier. Well, if you win 20 wins, you 20 games, you were going to be in, you know, but well, that's not the case anymore. You know, it's, it's just, it's just not J just clearing 20 wins is not enough. You've got to win the right games. And so far they've, they've done that once, um, you know, going on the road to Georgia tech, I think was a quad two win. So that's a good one. Uh, and they'll have some opportunities here. There'll be some opportunities coming up over the next couple weeks and next month and a half uh, to to get some quality wins. But it's not, you know, twenty just hitting twenty wins is not going to guarantee you a spot in the NCAA tournament. So eight and four is is good. I, I don't think you can afford to go less than that. You know, I don't think you can afford to go seven and five. Uh, but you probably need to shoot for like nine and three, which is going to get really tough. And then you're going to need to win some in the ACC tournament. This question I, I think is is great. Um, Panther and Wahoo fan asks, if Nick Saban was 10 years younger and decided his lifelong dream was to wrap up his career as coach of the Panthers, do you think he would win a national championship? I think we'd see a jump in excitement and resources to help us get higher pedigree assistance in recruiting retaining players. If he planned to stay 10 years, I think he could build up the talent to break through once in the new 14-team playoff. I, uh, isn't it 12 teams? Either way. Um, I think this is a great question. And, and, and it's one that you never really be able to answer, but it's a great question that leads, I think, to a debate that encapsulate, encapsulates a lot of what college sports are. 
You know, it encapsulates a lot of what college football is because there is a notion, not, you know, unjustly uh, or not incorrectly, a notion of college football being made up of the haves and have nots. And that there are those programs that have built in advantages uh, via resources, via fan support, via history, tradition, name recognition and all those things. And those built in advantages when managed by a good coach, let alone a great coach, keeps them at the top of the heap and always in contention for the playoffs, always in contention for the postseason success. And this applies to basketball as well, but let's keep the focus just on college football here as we have this conversation. And so th there's a feeling that, you know, we often hear things like Alabama recruits itself, Ohio State recruits itself, Texas recruits itself. The implication being that, that these programs are sort of established machines and what they really just need is a good coach and or a great coach to put them over the top into to you know dynasty, which is what Nick Saban did at Alabama. I've always thought it would be interesting to see one of these guys who is the best. You know, I mean, one one of the truly best guys. You know, it's Saban, um, Urban Meyer, right? Go to don't you don't have to go to Akron. You know, Urban Meyer doesn't have to go back to Bowling Green or someplace like that. Go to a uh, upper middle tier power five program, power four program, go to Pitt, go to Georgia Tech, go to Minnesota, go to Oregon State, um, go to Arizona State, go to, you know, Texas Tech, um, you know, run, run through the list of programs. This is the vast majority of the power four, power four programs, right? If you put Urban Meyer there, if you put Nick Saban there, could they win at that level? You know I mean, because they would be in a situation where they obviously have the, the resources and, and, and like Urban Meyer is an interesting guy because, you know, dominated at Utah, right? Um, you know, put, put together great seasons. Okay. Or Chris Peterson will be another one. You know, he did it at Boise State and he went on and did it at Washington. You know, Urban Meyer, if he was to go, um, you know, to one of these other programs where he's still facing power power four competition could he elevate it and win at the levels that he won at ohio state and florida you know could nick saban elevate could could nick saban take west virginia and you know just because that seems like an even more fitting example could he take it to you know get it to the level that he got ohio or uh, that he got alabama you know get it to the level he got lsu and, and it becomes a question, you know, I, I, my personal opinion is that there's, there's a very small handful of guys that there's a small handful of guys who are truly elite and they are truly the best of the best. And that those guys can take a really good program or a great program and make it elite, can make it a dynasty and, and they can win. And, and, it comes at great costs, probably to them personally. It comes at great costs to their health, I, I assume. It comes at great costs to, to a lot. Uh, certainly the university it would cost a lot. But the success would come. Could Nick Saban do it at Pitt? Could Nick Saban, even with the resources, uh, could he get that caliber of athlete to Pitt? Could he get that caliber of athlete to Boston College? Could he get that caliber of player to, uh, you know, Take your pick, you know, uh, Illinois. <coughs> Could he get that caliber to NC State? And I just don't know. You know, I don't, I, I, I think there's, for the programs that are able to truly achieve at a high level over an extended period of time, maybe he could do it once. You know, maybe he could have that one-off that now, I mean, Chris Peterson and Kalen DeBoer have had at Washington. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's happened twice is not exactly a one-off, but it's sort of each one sort of independently feels like a one-off. Could he have that one-off at, at a school like Pitt? I, I, I think he could, but I don't know that he could necessarily build it into a consistent winner. I just don't know if the support will follow, but maybe, maybe he is that good. You know, maybe, maybe guys like Nick Saban, Urban Meyer, I would throw Chris Peterson into that group. He didn't win a national championship, but I mean, the guy's a winner, you know, and he has he has built winning programs in multiple places, places that weren't didn't they, that weren't necessarily established as having a history of success. 
And he's built winners there. I think Nick Saban, if he came to Pitt for 10 years, would win a national championship because I think he truly is that good. But I think if you're going to go to a school like that, you've you've got to be one of the elites. You've got to be one of the great coaches um, to do it. I think. You know, but but I say that. Well, so I was just going to say, well, I say that, but Pitt was, you know, just on, you know they were on on the cusp of of a playoff berth in 2021 if they just take care of business against western michigan if they just take care of business against miami they're, they're right there they could be right in the mix but maybe that's the difference the nick saban's teams for the most part didn't have a game like western michigan they didn't have a game like miami where they just get you know they give up three touchdowns forget everything about that miami game they gave up three touchdowns in like the first quarter on with a bunch of missed tackles nick saban's teams didn't do that or they don't do that very often they might do it here and there. They'll have, a, they'll have a stinker. They'll have a clunker. But for the most part, his attention to detail, his focus and effort, and, and how he pushes his players, in addition to the caliber of athlete he's getting, they don't have that game. And so maybe that's the separator. Maybe that's what a coach like Saban can push you over the top by eliminating those games. But it's an interesting question. That That's another one. I, I want to hear from you guys in in the you know either on twitter or on the comments on the video or on the message boards of pantheler.com because we'll post this on the basketball board and the football board i want to hear from you guys about your thoughts bob carrington jalen low as freshman versus xavier johnson trey mcgallans as freshman and could nick saban win a national championship at Pitt if he had 10 years to do it and if you say yes how many would he win in those 10 years these are great questions. These are great questions. You guys came through big time this week. I really appreciate it. I like these questions. I'm going to be thinking about a lot. I don't want to hear what your response is uh, to those questions as well. So, um, like and subscribe. That's what we always ask you to do, right? Like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel and then check out the website, panther lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com, to never miss any of our pit video content. <laughs> no, no, no pittsburgh.rivals.com for all of the pit football basketball and recruiting coverage it's the end of the week people my mind is done i am done and you are done you've had a great week i hope you've had a great week i've had a great week enjoy your friday like and subscribe and we will talk to you tomorrow don't forget the post game show after the miami game tomorrow right here on youtube.com slash